Hi, I'm Liling, and I'm so glad you're here. I'll be sharing with you my thoughts on parenting mindfully. Whether you're an expecting parent who's curious about mindful parenting because you're thinking about the parent that you'd like to be when your baby arrives, or you're a parent of multiple children who needs to reset and recenter, I hope you'll find some takeaways from this talk that will be helpful in your parenting journey. I'd like to start with a little story about how I came to know about and care about mindful parenting. When my firstborn was about a year old, we were living overseas and for about a week, my husband had gone back to Singapore for work. I was alone, taking care of my daughter without help and company. Most of that week is just a blur to me now. But I remember one particular incident where I was trying to cook a meal for us and she was clinging to my legs, crying incessantly. I couldn't calm her down and my tank was running empty. I became increasingly frustrated and helpless. I started shouting at her to tell me what she wants, which she of course couldn't. And my behaviour only frightened her more and intensified her crying. I didn't know it at the time, but looking back, I was dysregulated to the point where I had an urge to hurt her physically. That scared me because the pictures in my head were ugly. Of course, my rational brain didn't want to hurt her and it took everything in me to fight those urges. I remember standing in front of her while she cried on the couch when in the middle of me battling my urges, I suddenly had a very visceral flashback. I saw myself as a little girl who was about five or six then, and I was crying while sitting on the kitchen countertop. My father had put me there, and he towered over me and he shouted at me to stop crying. You stop crying now or you'll get it. It being physical punishment. This is a memory that I have always remembered, along with many other very similar experiences I had growing up. I did not think of this encounter as one that stood out from the many other times my parents told me to stop crying or even punished me physically. And yet, in that flashback, I felt for the first time how terrified my five-year-old self was at that time, and also how out of control my father was and how much I struggled to suppress my cries in order to avoid pain. When I came out of that flashback, my daughter was still crying, but I was no longer as triggered. And suddenly I understood why I became so dysregulated from hearing her cries and even had those urges to hurt her. It just clicked. My flashback helped me realize that her cries were so hard for me to listen to because I was not allowed to cry when I was growing up. And in fact, crying often led to a very real threat of emotional, mental, and even physical pain. After that episode, I became very interested in learning more about my strange flashback experience and how my childhood was clearly affecting my present as a parent. This led me to a book by Dr. Dan Siegel called Parenting from the Inside Out. One of my biggest takeaways from the book is this quote. When parents don't take responsibility for their own unfinished business, they miss an opportunity not only to become better parents, but also to continue their own development. I realized that I was making my daughter responsible for my discomfort and my dysregulation when I need to be the person who takes responsibility for my own feelings and needs. My triggers stem from my unresolved childhood issues. A big part of mindful parenting is therefore to become aware of what our own triggers are so that instead of operating on autopilot, acting out past hurts and unfairly directing our anger on our children and the people in our lives, we can be more present and intentional in choosing to respond to our children in a way that prioritizes the relationship and the connection. 
this is what I care about a lot and it fills me with meaning to be able to share this with other parents. So how do we as parents become more mindful? When I attended a life-changing course three years ago, my trainer summarized mindfulness in just two words. Just notice. It's one of those mantras that is deceptively simple, but actually hard to do, and yet holds infinite wisdom. Over the years, through some trial and error, and learning from teachers who have crossed my path, including my children, who are my greatest teachers, I found a few practices that helped me to just notice. I'd like to share three of my practices with you so that we can find more presence on our parenting journeys. For the first practice, I'd like to invite you to join me in a short embodiment exercise. First, find a comfortable position, either seated or lying down, or even standing. If you'd like to, you can close your eyes so that you can channel your focus inwards. Notice how your body feels right now in this position. Now hold your hands in front of your chest and ball your fists up as tightly as you can and hold that posture. Notice the sensations in your body. Where in your body do you feel tightness? What other sensations do you notice? What is your breath like? And your heart rate? Now relax your fists and allow your palms to open, facing upwards. And you can rest your palms on your lap if you're sitting. Notice the sensations in your body. Do you notice any shifts in the tension in different parts of your body? And what's your breath and your heart rate like? When you're ready, you can open your eyes. How was that for you? I wonder if you noticed any differences within your body when you were clenching your fists and when your hands were relaxed and open. In the first posture, many people notice tightness not just in their hands, but also in their shoulders, their chest, throat, even their head. Some people feel their fingernails pressing into the flesh of their palms. And when you took the open palm gesture, how did that feel? Did you notice the tension dissipate? And maybe even notice that you are able to take deeper, slower breaths? This exercise is related to the first practice in noticing that I'd like to share with you. It is to start becoming more aware of our bodies and our physiological cues. There's a word for this, it's called interoception. Interoception is the awareness of what's going on inside our body. Do you feel tension, pain, discomfort? Is your heart beating fast? Are your breaths shallow? Are you hungry, full? Do you need to use the bathroom? And so on. There are receptors in our joints, our muscles, organs, skin, and these receptors send information to our brain, which in turn regulates our vital functions, such as our heart rate, digestion, hunger, and body temperature. 
Interoception also helps us to be more attuned to our body's cues so that we can better interpret and identify our emotions. Many people are disconnected from their emotions and bodily sensations, perhaps because of years of conditioning from society, where we were taught to tune out our sensations and emotions because those things are seen as inconveniences. I remember a friend told me once that her son complained of tummy ache before swim class and he was told by the coach that if he didn't join the class that he must be a girl and that he can come to class next week in a dress. Aside from the gender stereotype that is shocking, the boy decided after hearing that that Despite his tummy aches, he will join the class. You may not have heard these exact same shaming words when you were growing up, but you probably have received similar messages that taught you over time that your bodily sensations and your feelings are not as important as other things that are deemed important by society, like school, work, results. It may have sounded more benign and even well-intentioned, like a parent telling you that you have to eat more even after you say that you're full. Over time, we learn to tune out the messages that we receive from our brain and our body. And many of us become quite the expert at doing that. Not eating, not sleeping, not drinking water, not using the toilet, these things almost become like badges of honor that we boast about. As a result, Many people are no longer attuned to our interoceptive sense and we become desensitized to our sensations and emotions. As parents, our interoceptive sense acts like an oximeter. Many of us have oximeters in our homes these days to measure our oxygen levels and our pulse rate. When our oxygen drops below a certain level, we know we have to consult a doctor. Similarly, our interoceptive sense is like our inbuilt oximeter that sends us signals so that we, we are more aware of our mental, emotional and physical state. Simply put, this is helpful to us as parents because it lets us know at any moment, am I calm or am I stressed? When we did the exercise earlier, did you notice the sensations in your body when you clenched your fists? Those sensations might be similar to what you feel when you're under stress. On the other hand, the openness and lightness you felt when you held your palms open might be closer to what it feels like in your body when you're calm. I try to check in with how I'm feeling in my body when I'm with my children. Sometimes I notice that in reaction to something that they have done or said, my chest and shoulders tighten and my heart beats faster and my breathing becomes shallow. These are my cues that inform me that I am stressed and I might be becoming dysregulated. If I don't take steps to regulate myself before I respond, it's very likely that my autopilot reaction to their behavior will be from my conditioning. I might shout or say hurtful things to them. Instead of helping them to calm down, I will be escalating their distress or their hyperarousal. On the other hand, if I check in and notice that my body feels relaxed and my heart rate and breathing are normal, these signal to me that I am calm. In this regulated state, I have more capacity to choose a response that is different from my autopilot reaction. A response that fosters connection and will help to lower the arousal levels of my children so that they can become regulated too. This is important because calm begets calm. We can't help our children to calm down if we ourselves are not. So get to know your body's signals. What does stress feel like in your body? And what does calm feel like? We're all different, 
and each of us will have to get to know our own body and its cues, especially if we've been conditioned to ignore our sensations and our emotions. So the first practice in parenting more mindfully is to check in with our interoceptive sense. What is my body telling me about my current state? Am I calm or am I stressed? The next practice is to ask, what am I telling myself? Let me share a story as an example. Some time ago, I became very angry when we were packing up the house and my older daughter was lying on the floor, refusing to participate. It's not the first time I have gotten upset when the house is in a mess. But this time, I was way past upset. I was not in a regulated state, and I did not notice my signs. When I saw her lying on the floor, I became increasingly angry. And the thought that kept surfacing in my mind was that she's lazy and she's inconsiderate. My anger escalated and I blurted to her, you're so useless. The moment those words escaped my mouth, I saw her face and her body collapse in shame. And I was instantly reminded of the shame that ate me up when I was a child and when my father said in dialect that I was a waste of rice. Again, I had unfairly passed on the pain of my own childhood to my daughter. And perhaps my father said those words to me because he was told the same when he was growing up. As a society, we commonly blame others for our own uncomfortable feelings. And many of us may have borne the brunt of our parents' anger when we were young. I find these words by Dr. Marshall Rosenberg very helpful as a reminder. What others do may be the stimulus of our feelings, but never the cause. Our children's words and actions do not cause our feelings. Our feelings are often a result of what we tell ourselves about their words and actions. In the earlier story, I told myself that she is lazy and inconsiderate, which then triggered my anger. On a different day, when I might be more regulated, I might be able to look at the same behavior and instead of seeing laziness, I might be seeing tiredness. And then my response to her would be one that is more compassionate. So the second practice is therefore to just notice what we are telling ourselves. When I notice my thoughts, I can frame it with, I'm telling myself that. This is a way to remind myself that what comes after is just what I'm telling myself. It is an assumption and not necessarily reality. This practice helps me to create some distance between my children's behaviours, which is the stimulus, and my feelings. The distance gives me space to check my assumptions and to put on a lens that is more curious and compassionate. Okay, this is what I'm telling myself. But what is she really feeling and needing? Is her behavior truly out of laziness or could it be that she is experiencing some stress and has needs that are not met? It could also give me room to recognize that I have needs that are not met and my feelings are probably more a reflection of my need for rest and support. The third practice in noticing is to get to know yourself better and recognize your triggers. As you practice noticing your interoceptive sense and the stories you tell yourself, you might find that there are certain recurring patterns in the behaviors and situations that tend to disrupt your inner peace. These are your triggers. For me, some of my triggers, among many, are mess and crying. 
as you may have noticed in the stories that I've shared. Learning what our triggers are can help us to, number one, prevent problems, and number two, manage our reactivity. Let me explain. If you know that certain things tend to be triggering for you, then you can find solutions to prevent things from escalating. So for example, some people are triggered by lateness. And so the morning rush to leave home, send children to school on time and get to work on time tend to really rock some parents' patience and equanimity. If you know that lateness is your trigger, then you might be able to find ways to reduce the need to rush in the morning, like choosing your clothes and making sure that all the bags are packed in the night before, or making breakfasts that can be eaten on the go, and so on. And if you know that you are easily triggered when you're worried about being late, then you will mentally prepare yourself so that you are already on the lookout for your alarm bells, which are your signals from your body and also the common stories that you tell yourself, like, if I walk into the office late, everyone will stare at me and judge me for being irresponsible. The more you practice noticing the signals in your body and the stories that you play in your head, the more you'll be able to pick out behaviours and situations that tend to trigger you. So the third practice brings together the first two practices. All three practices are really about getting to know ourselves better and on a much deeper level. They help us to become more mindful of ourselves. And as parents, this mindfulness is the door to more peace, whether it be inside ourselves or within the family, and also connection and compassion in our relationships with our children. I've shared three practices, and I'd like to just share one more note before we end, which is that mindful parenting is a journey and not a destination. There's no end point where you get to and you're now an expert who have mastered mindfulness and you will never lose your cool ever again. And life with your children now looks like something from a commercial with warm sunlight and everyone's always smiling and laughing and happy and in clean clothes. As I spoke about these practices, I caught myself feeling guilt and shame because I'm not always successful at doing these things myself. I have to remind myself often that mindful parenting is a journey and that along the way, we are going to have ups and downs. It might feel sometimes like we are taking one step forward and two steps back. So please have compassion for yourself and take time to celebrate your little successes because as parents, we tend to beat ourselves up too much for our mistakes. Remember the experiential exercise where you clenched your fists tightly and then opened your palms? Let's do one more now. Place your hands on your chest. Notice the sensations in your body. What's your breath like? Where do you feel tight or open in your body? I'm curious how that felt for you. Many people feel a softening in their body and a warmth in their chest. Perhaps your breathing and your heart rate slowed down. This is how giving ourselves compassion feels like. As you strive to grow as a person and become better parents, I hope you take time often to visit this place and notice your needs, your needs for rest, support, 
kindness, compassion, understanding, acceptance, and fun. Bringing mindfulness into my parenting has brought so much more meaning and connection to me and my relationships with my children and my husband. I hope you have found some helpful takeaways that can be stepping stones in your mindful parenting journey. I appreciate you taking time to listen to me and I hope this met your need for learning, growth or some time to connect to yourself. If you'd like to join a community of parents who are also on this journey of parenting mindfully, you can join the Facebook group supported by Chapter Zero. We're called Respectful slash Mindful Parenting SG. If you follow Chapter Zero's Instagram and Facebook accounts, you can get tips and tools that we share on parenting. And finally, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Chapter Zero is a team of four women who are passionate about contributing to parents so that more families can experience the joy of peaceful partnerships with their children. I wish you all the best on your parenting journey.